Hello, everyone. Welcome to this Wise Words Academic Seminar hosted by the Contemplative Studies Center at the University of Melbourne. I'm Dr. Julieta Galante, Deputy Director of the Center. I would like to begin by respectfully acknowledging the traditional owners of the unceded land on which we work, learn, and live, the Wurundjeri, Boiwurrung, and Banwurrung peoples. We pay respect to elders, past, present, and future, and to any indigenous people present today. Today we're joined by Dr. Alejandro Chaul, director of the Jung Center's Mind, Body, Spirit Institute in Houston, Texas. In today's presentation, Alejandro will discuss trulcor, textual and oral traditions, and how they have been practiced in different settings and cultures, including research and clinical settings for people with cancer and their caregivers. If you have any questions, please post them in the Q&A at any stage, and Alejandro will address as many as possible towards the end of the session. Welcome, Ale. Thank you. Thank you, Juli. It's so good to, to be here, um, even online. So thank you, everyone who made this possible, Kathleen and Ty and everyone. And thank you, everyone who's uh, watching because of this way of doing things in a webinar, it's hard, we don't see you, but uh, hopefully we'll interact in some way at the end. Um, so um, let me start by also uh, acknowledging uh, everyone in uh, all the indigenous traditions, um, including actually the Tibetan traditions that I'll be talking about, um, even though I'm not in that land today. Um, this is the, the, the tradition that really inspired me to do this. And as you see in my background, I have a Tibetan tanka. Um, and in the tanka, there is a being of light, which is called tapiritsa, which is a being um, that uh, is said to be, uh, that lived in the eighth century and really a very important part of the lineage of the Shangshu Ninja lineage that I'll talk about. But under him, is Lopun Tenzin Namdak, and I'll, you'll see him in a picture when I present, but he's really uh, my root teacher and um, the one who, with whom I started this journey back in 91 and through him to Tenzin Wanjiru and the whole burn lineage, which is actually the indigenous uh, tradition of Tibet. And so um, with that, I'll, um, as Huli said, I'm going to start with a PowerPoint and then I'll let that go and then we'll can uh, discuss. Great. So um, partly I, I call this from the Himalayas to the clinic as as as, as Julio as Dr. said, you know, this is uh, the practice of Trungkor or Tibetan yoga and how they were brought through kind of Tibet to Nepal and India and then to the West and from the West into places like the Texas Medical Center, which is one of the largest medical centers in the world, uh, but also into medical settings in general, which actually was also the, um, uh, the theme, the topic of my dissertation. So what you see here, it's the beautiful monastery of Menri. Menri means medicine mountain. And this one is the one located in India because as the Tibetans had to go into exile, like uh, many of the different Tibetan teachers were able, some of them were able to rebuild their monasteries in exile. And this is in Dolanji, north of India. And one of the beautiful things to me, besides of the connection to my teachers and all the things that I've learned there is that it's nestled in a little village called Dolanji where it's a Tibetan village within the Indian uh, place to the Indian uh, city. Um, um, and then uh, within that, there's a school and there's the monastery, there's the nunnery, and there's a place also for Westerners to go and study. Um, and also they built a, um, a medical school that has both Tibetan medicine as well as uh, Western medicine. So really it's an amazing place of learning. And so um, kind of I bow down to this place that I've got um, the honor and um, 
to be there many, many, many times as I was doing, as I was uh, um, studying, then doing my dissertation, and then after that, continuing. Now, let me tell you a little bit of a personal story, which is what brought me to this tradition, because I was, uh, like Juli, actually, was born in Argentina. And, um, and Argentina is a very Catholic country, and I was born in a Jewish family, and I was searching, searching because I had what I used to call existential attacks. And the existential attacks were I would wake up at night with kind of sweating and feeling like I'm going to die, and then what? And it was really disconcerting, and I couldn't find how to deal with that until this book came to my lap. And many of you probably have read it, uh, Siddhartha by Hermann Hesse, and uh, which I realized after a few readings that it was actually the life of the Buddha, of Buddha Shakyamuni. But one of the things that really struck me was that it was talking about the four sufferings, the suffering of birth, of old age, of sickness, and of death. And I really related to that concept and, and really trying to connect. So how these existential attacks, how can we make sense of them? And really that kind of sent me into the stream, into this path of, you can think of the Buddhist tradition. And then I did uh, my uh, undergrad actually in communications but also started learning about philosophy and then Oriental philosophy. And through that, I felt, well, I need to go to India. And when I, got, I went to India, I actually met many, met many teachers, many in the Hindu tradition, such as Swami Chinmayananda. I met uh, Yuji Krishnamurti. But really the person that struck me was His Solonis, the Dalai Lama. And... The first time I actually met him, um, it was when he was doing the 40th anniversary of the TCV, of the Tibetan Children Village in Dharamsala. Um, but I hadn't really known much of him, except that I had been traveling through India, and particularly through Ladakh, where India makes like a little mushroom on the top, right? And there were a lot of Tibetan monasteries, and I would see his photo there, and the monks really revering him. Now. I didn't speak any Tibetan then, they didn't speak any English or Spanish, so we communicated only by face uh, gestures, hand gestures, uh, but it was very clear the kind of reverence that they had for this man. And when I was in Dharamsala and I got to meet him, I got to meet him in a public, what they call a public blessing. And it was an amazing moment for me because I reached to him uh, with a kata, which is the classic way of addressing a teacher. Actually, I have one right here. So I reached to him with a kata and I, you know, I gave it to him and he asked me, uh, what's your name? And I just couldn't speak. I, I don't know what was happening. And he asked me another question, which I don't even remember. And he said, Okay, keep on going. Here's your blessing. Gave me back the kata, right? And I continued. And with that, I was, I sat in a tree still in his residence and I was crying. And I was crying and I, I wasn't sure what was going on, but it was really profound. And then the guards actually came and said, hey, you have to leave, right? And as I was about to leave, the last person in the line uh, for this public blessing came and he was a Japanese photographer. And he asked his holiness, is there anything that, um, that you wanna tell me? And he said, no, nothing. And then he turned around and said, yes, a good heart is the best religion. And as simple as that line sounds, it was very profound to me. And that again, opened really this journey that for me became kind of, uh, you know, a, a game changer, a, a path changer in my life. So a couple of years later, we were able to bring him to Argentina. And um, 
And we compiled some of his teachings into this book, Un Buen Corazón es la Mejor Religión, A Good Heart is the Best Religion. And it was a, a wonderful opportunity to be with him, but also a wonderful opportunity to bring him to my country. And then that inspired me in wanting to understand more. And that's what brought me into, uh, into the States and really trying to understand this Tibetan religion. So even though in my undergrad, I was doing communications and philosophy for my uh, grad work, I was very clear, this is what I wanted to study, Tibetan tradition. And particularly, uh, although in my master's, I really was working more on another practice called Chu and kind of a, a way of a ritual of feeling that you're cutting your body, cutting your ego and offering it. Really, uh, for my PhD, I focused on Trungkor. And, and this practice of Trungkor, Tibetan yoga, is really a, a, a very uh, important practice, but not so much practiced by many. Because within the curriculum of the Tibetan practices, it's at the very end. So in a way different than in other traditions where the body is used as as an early means to connect to the mind. Here in the Tibetan tradition, you sit and do, you know, focus practice or, you know, uh, shamatha and then vipassana, right? So uh, kind of focus practice and then inside practice. And then you start doing other practice of cultivation of the different qualities. And then you start bringing your body as connecting to the subtle body, the breath, the channels, and so forth. But I was very fortunate, at least from my perspective, to receive these practices early on in my path. And partly was thanks to Namkai Norbrun Pache, so the picture on the top left. Um, and Namkai Norbrun Pache came to Argentina, and I was I was asked to translate for him. And um, and he was learning what he called Yantra Yoga, which was a way of retranslating into Sanskrit Trungkor, or in, in the way that the, the, the book, the text that he was working with, was one from Vairochana in the 8th century, which was the Nida Kajor Trungkor, or the Trungkor of the union of sun and moon. And when I learned this practice, it was really another moment of Wow, because I had been practicing Indian styles of yoga, I'd been practicing Tai Chi and Qigong, um, but I always felt they were kind of such a different practice that what I was doing in my meditation that was Tibetan, that I had to do it almost in different times. So having Tibetan yoga felt like, oh, I can do this all together. And through that, Namka Nobrim Kupuche told me you need to meet Lopon Tenzing Namdak, which is the picture down, the, the, um, the older of the two people in the, in the bottom in color, uh, which is the same one that I mentioned here in the Tanka. He's now 97 years old and lives in Nepal in Tritonabutse Monastery. And it was him that I met first when this Bon tradition. And partly was because I was organizing the visit of the Dalai Lama to Argentina and Namka Norbu knew that. And so he sent me, he said, you know, Lopon will speak before he'd be one of the five speakers of one of each tradition. So you need to go meet him. And when I went to meet him, it was like, wow. And I followed him. And then two years later, I actually met the person to his, uh, well, left on the picture, but right for us, uh, Tenzin Wanda Rinpoche. And when I saw them together, it was like the whole refuge tree became alive. And so I've been studying with them for the last 30 plus years, 32 with Lopon, 30 with uh, Rinpoche. And Trungkor was one of the main things that I studied. I learned it in Trita Norbutse with one of the younger monks there. But then also, if you see the top right photo, that's Hisones Lungto Tempanima, who passed away a couple of years. And he was the abbot of Menri Monastery that I showed you. And he was particularly, he was a doctor also. And he was also very uh, a, a practitioner of uh, Trungkor, or Tsalung and Trungkor. I'll mention a little more about Tsalung in a minute. 
And so uh, I went, Rinpoche asked me, go study with him and learn from him. So I was very fortunate to learn both in the academic setting as well as in the monasteries, both with the Solines in Menri Monastery and with Lopun Tenzin Andak in Tritano would say. And then again, having Tenzin Wander Rinpoche in the States and coming back and telling him what I've learned and kind of processing it together with him, uh, which has been a, a wonderful journey. One of the things that you might notice uh, from this picture, which is actually a, a mural in the Lulakang in Lhasa, in the back of the Potala, sometimes they call it the Temple of the Dalai Lama. And, um, and these, you can see that these postures are actually in movement. So they're not like the classic asanas in the Indian yogic tradition, but they're in movement, but also different than Tai Chi or Qigong, while you're moving, you're holding your breath. So you're holding your breath, mostly in a specific chakra or in the whole central channel, and then you do a movement and at the end you exhale, sometimes with sounds such as ha and pe, and as you release, it's like coming back into that state, not only of relax, but a state of openness. And so for me, when I learned these practices, it was like uh, an eye opener. It was more like a heart opener. It was like, but a strong, it, it, it had such a power. It was almost like, if you didn't get it with this posture, you'll get it with that, almost like slapping me on my face to really get it. Um, but I, 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 I didn't feel it as, as a rough. I felt it as a, almost like a, you know, uh, you know, a parent trying to help you wake up. And, um, I was really interested in this, but I also got very interested in kind of the dialogues between the contemplatives and the science. And particularly the Dalai Lama, again, has been, you know, uh, an incredible leader in this area. Um, um, and, you know, through him, he and um, others started, for example, Mind, the Mind and Life Institute with uh, I know Julia and I were there a couple of times. And this idea that spirituality and science are complementary and that actually they have that goal of, you know, seeking human knowledge and wisdom. So to contribute to expanding that horizon rather than butting heads as we think of them in some times. And so really this for me was, a, was another way of openness that I hadn't seen before and I felt very comfortable with. And as I was getting into this area, um, I remember reading this incredible article that for me was, was a seminal article, even though it was back in the 70s. And this was published in the journal Science, and it was by George Engel. And he was telling us about the need of a new biomedical, uh, a new medical model that was challenging biomedicine. And what it means challenging biomedicine is that it was not just about physical health, but that actually health was at the intersection of the physical, the social, and the psycho-spiritual. Now, if we didn't get it in the 70s, we sure got it by during COVID time, right? I mean, the importance of social health and psycho-spiritual health now cannot be undermined. And so really thinking of health in this way made it such a holistic or ha such a whole way of thinking about it that it made, again, it made so much sense to me. And together with that, Herbert Benson and the relaxation response and the studies that he had done, particularly studying uh, originally with transcendental meditation, but really other ways also that he um, and, um, and others studied and realizing that it was very useful to counteract the famous stress response of the fight flight of, of, of freeze response. And so as he was doing that, he got interested in this area um, of, of research. And then he actually started studying some of the Tibetan tradition, particularly uh, the Tibetan Tumo Yoga. And Tumo Yoga is this practice of breathing that as you see, again, this, this photo is also from the Lula Kong. And, um, and actually what you see this kind of lines inside the body 
What it means is that there are channels where the breath circulates. And the fire at the top, again, what it means is that it produces heat. And he did a research um, um, that uh, was published in Nature, another very famous journal back in the 80s. And he showed that actually people at will could increase their heat in their body. And these were done in very cold places. So in a way, this aspect that mind can have an effect on the body. So when the, these practices all together came under a bigger rubric of what they called at the beginning alternative medicine and then complementary medicine and then integrative medicine, in the United States, the, the um, National Institutes of Health started by having a center called ENCOM, the National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine that then became ENCHI, the National Center of Complementary Integrative Health. And they talk about these mind-body practices as a variety of techniques designed to enhance the mind's capacity to affect bodily functions and symptoms. And with that, we would see in the public media, all these uh, you know, magazines on meditation and yoga on how your mind can heal your body. But also, as we looked at people starting practicing, and again, I'm focusing in the US, that's the, the research that I have. But this is uh, back in 2018, the last census that they've done. And you can see how even from the previous one in 2012 to 2017, the increase both of yoga and even more of meditation, that people, adults over 18 in the US are now, you know, at least 15%, probably by now 18 or 19% of people practicing these techniques. And so really thinking of them within um, that area of, I was saying of NCHI, of the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health. Now, so if we think of this together, for me, it was like, Okay, like you see in the left, you have the uh, angle, but also on the center, this aspect of illness narrative that um, um, the um, medical ethics uh, professor at Harvard, Arthur Kleinman did on illness narrative, really thinking of not just the disease, but really the illness experience. What is the patient as a whole and the family as a whole experiencing besides that specific disease. And then even thinking of the medicine Buddha mandala and how it's much more than just that disease, but it's really all these different um, healers, all these different medicines and in a mandala, meaning that it goes from the center to the periphery, right? And in this mandala, you can see at the center medicine Buddha and then at, around all his or her, um, you know, people, uh, doctors, but could be of different traditions, uh, and then all the medicines, right? So center to the periphery, periphery to the center. And when I was at MD Anderson at this cancer center, a big cancer center in Houston that I worked there for 20 years, every Thursday morning, um, we would meet, uh, not in a square, but in a rectangular table, and we would have we would discuss the patient and their family at the center. And we would have all around us, we would be an acupuncturist, a massage therapist, an oncologist, a palliative care doc, you know, a mind body. And we would all think what's the best for this patient and their family. So what are the different medicines, the different ways of healing that we can help them with? And that's how integrative medicine started. It started really as a place called place of wellness, um, kind of thinking of the psychosocial aspects of the patients and then really became a center, integrative medicine center that had a, a clinical arm, a research arm, and an education arm. So really thinking of how we bring Engel's model into these practices of the physical, the social, and kind of the mind-body, the psycho-spiritual. And so you can see, actually, on the left, that's uh, Gabriel Lopez, who's the medical director, and all the different, so he would meet with patients, then direct them to the different practices, and all together uh, be for the benefit of the patients. In the research area, I really focused on Tibetan yoga, 
with different populations. And the reason I started with lymphoma was not because Tibetan texts mentioned that, but rather because one of the doctors was a practitioner and really was saying, well, what about doing something with my patients? And then the same with uh, other people after that study, and I'll mention about these studies, got interested in the population of breast cancer and then lung cancer. And these are the areas that I'll speak a little more. And we always did them in conjunction with the Ligmincha Institute, which is the center that uh, Tenzin Wonder and Purchase started. And so that it was not just taking the things uh, by uh, you know, researchers on a void, on a vacuum, but actually in uh, collaboration with the Tibetan tradition. And as you can, you know, you any research takes you know a lot of people. So I, you know, before I start talking about the research, I want to thank all the people that collaborated on these different research projects. So the first one that we ended up uh, uh, publishing in '94 was really these um, with lymphoma patients, as I mentioned. And what we found is that their sleep quality, it was a randomized controlled trial. So somewhere in the Tibetan yoga intervention, somewhere in standard of care. And what we found is that those that were in the Tibetan yoga intervention um, improved sleep quality, quantity, latency, and with less medicine. And it was actually, I realized later, my colleague, Lorenzo Cohen, the PI, the principal investigator, was telling me that actually this was the first a uh, randomized controlled trial of a yoga practice in a cancer population. Uh, so this was back in 94, 2004. Yeah, 2004. <laughs> but one of the things that I wanted to keep as we were doing the intervention, which is really how we bring these practices into the research, is how the text talks about these practices. And the text talks about these Tibetan yogas to enhance the meditative practice, what in Tibetan we call Bugdun, to dispel obstacles, the Gexel. But then really the most important part is, as we do that, how we integrate it into daily life. So one of the things that it brought is, what kind of breathings do we do? And there's an alternative nostril, alternate nostril breathing that clears what we call in the Tibetan tradition, the three main poisons. So the poison of anger, the one of attachment, the town of confusion. And so as we connect to that is, can we let some of that anger release so we can feel more space? Some of that attachment release and that space, some of that confusion release and that space. And that's why it says right, left and central because these are the kind of breathings that we do. And really then incorporate the channels because that's really another way of thinking of, of how we do this practice. And sometimes we say that the mind is like the rider, the breath is like the horse, and it travels through these different channels. And, in, and, and, and this is also in the Tibetan medicine. And in the Tibetan medicine, they talk about these five con uh, functions of the breath, the upward moving breath, the life force breath, the fire and equanimity breath, the downward and clearing, and the pervasive breath. And there's a particular text um, I was saying earlier, Tsalung. So sometimes we think of Trungkor as, which actually it's translated as magical movements as Tsalung Trungkor. And Sa means channels, Lung means breath, or, you know, for those who do Indian yoga, Nadi, nadi and Prana. And the idea is that it's by doing these five kinds of breath, you are helping the circulation energetic circulation of your whole system. And there's a text in the Bun tradition called the Mother Tantra that has one movement for each of this breath. There's a text in Trungkor of the Atri Trungkor that has different movements for each text. And, and then we put it together with Tenzi Wanda Rinpoche in a, in a way of 16 movements, one which is what they call a a non draw or a fundamental, and then three for each of these uh, of these five kinds of breath. So trying to bring them in a way that makes them accessible for people to practice. Now within the research itself, we we had a baseline. We had 
seven yoga sessions and and they practice that with an instructor um and then we had a one month post three months post six months post and um and that's the the one with lymphoma patients and that's the one that ended up with that results particularly on sleep but thanks to that we did another one another pilot study with breast cancer because breast cancer as you know is the largest population of cancer and really also that the majority is women that get breast cancer and they are very kind of committed to doing more practice i think they're much go more like gung ho you know into doing practices and so we 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 found that in that population those that were undergoing chemotherapy um, uh, felt you know improved much more even than those that were doing radiation and so we addressed that population and we got a large grant from the nci which is the national cancer institute here in the states and we did this randomized control trial and one of the things that we found in that study was something that our clinical doctors like, which is what's the dose that we need to recommend? And what we found in this study is that in order to get the results that we got earlier, they needed to practice at least three times a week. Those who practice twice a week or less didn't get the same results of three or more. And so in a way that was very helpful for Gabriel Lopez and his colleagues to say, oh, what we need to recommend is, yes, do this practice, but make it three times a week or more. That's when we find, at least the research finds, that you can get um, better, more benefits. Now, as we're thinking of this, again, it's, it's a way of thinking not just of health, but of optimal health. And how do we, you know, the caregivers also um, are impacted by, by this illness experience, as Kleinman would say. And so we decided to really focus on that aspect of the social. And so we did a study that was both for the patient and for the caregiver, really focusing on that aspect of connection. So you can think of connection as you do the meditation, but also that connection with the caregiver. And together with um, a colleague, a psychologist, Catherine Milbury, we did this study of really the connection through the meditation and through the diet of patient and caregiver. And this is the study that we designed that when they were doing this together, they would face the instructor as they learned, but then they would face each other. And when they face each other, besides the, the results, the clinical results that I'll share, and they're at the bottom of the screen, what they also found, what we also found or saw is that they would reach out to each other as they were practicing and grab their hands or reach with their toes. There was a sense of more connection to each other. Besides what you see um, in the screen about reduction of fatigue, of sleep on depression issues. And so we would see this clinical levels improvements both in patients and in caregivers. Let's see what's happening. Okay. Now, also, um, as some of our colleagues were pushing the envelope, once they saw that there were good results in what we were doing, it's like, what about the mind? What about the brain, right? And so there were things going on, uh, particularly in the lab of Richie Davidson at the University of Wisconsin. And um, and this is actually here with Mathieu Ricard. Maybe of you, many of you know him or know of him. Um, and what what Richie found is a number of things. But one of them is that within the brain, that the left frontal lobe was more activated with um, meditation. Um, we were trying to see what within cancer, how we can. Are there some things that we can uh, uh, affect positively with that. Uh, we also saw, like uh, in, in Richie's uh, uh, research, he found that not only uh, alterations in the brain were better, but also even immune function was better. And Sarah Lazar in Harvard found that 
uh, through the meditation and mindfulness practice, actually the gray matter was increased, almost like going to the gym, right? And you pump your muscles, going to the cushion, you know, as you meditate, you pump your brain. So all these things were really encouraging for us. And what we decided to do, one of the areas of uh, uh, brain issues in, um, in cancer is uh, something that they call chemo brain due to uh, chemotherapy. And so cognitive deficiency due to chemotherapy. And so we designed the study with sounds. And these were sounds coming again from the Tibetan tradition, these three sounds, ah, om, and hung. And the reason we decided for this is that it was not just sounds, but that with each sound, there's a mental task. Ah, of clearing, om, of connecting, hung, of bringing into everyday life. And again, what we found and published was that through that, they were actually uh, things that we could uh, see objectively, such as improvement in working memory um, and uh, speed cognitive function, but also their perceived, perceived cognitive impairment and the perceived mental um, awareness, as well as the spirituality and the depressive symptoms all were improved. So that was very uh, positive. And because of that, as we continued teaching at the Integrative Medicine Center now in terms of the clinical area and the classes, we would bring what we would learn in the research, bring it into the clinic. And so we would do uh, things with sounds, things with breath and movement and so forth. We also, um, I started a, an actual clinic of one-on-one, -on -one, and it was interesting to see that even sometimes after one session, there were clinical improvements in areas such as anxiety, fatigue, distress, well-being, sleep, depressive symptoms, memory, and pain. And so, again, for our clinical colleagues, it was good to say, okay, when one of these is affected why don't we send them to meditation in the same way that with other things, they would send them to uh, acupuncture or to massage and so forth. Um, and so in that way, the clinical faculty would know uh, what practices to, to, send, um, to send to, right? And then of course, we had a newsletter um, where we published the things, but it, in, a, in a way that it was, kind of not for scientists, but for patients. So they would know how to bring them into their lives. And also we created videos that are originally, they were done for uh, out, uh, sorry, for inpatients that couldn't come uh, to our outpatient clinic. And so we had them there, but now actually, you know, through the World Wide web, you could be in Melbourne and see them, right? And so they're accessible to everyone there. We also, uh, together with Gabriel Lopez, we, we created an app. Um, actually, I should have uh, uh, bought, uh, put the, uh, another slide because we just published that study uh, showing how actually it reduced anxiety. And this, this app was very simple. It only had three meditations and it had the English and Spanish. And um, as the, and, and we used them in a, what are they called, iPod Touch, that we cleaned of everything else and just had our app. And, um, and so as you start, you had it English to Spanish, and then you could choose the five minute, 10 minute or 15 minute. And what we also found is that as people got more familiar, they would go into longer sessions and they, those who got into longer sessions, their anxiety was reduced more. The other aspect that was important was not just thinking of meditation, but how it how it it's more of a comprehensive um, um, uh, study that included uh, uh, meditation and yoga. Uh, it included uh, nutrition. It included uh, uh, um, exercise, but also uh, psychologists, the health psychologists, to support the patient going through this. That. Like, yes, we know what to do, but what are the barriers that you need to go over the things that don't let you do it? And so that was very important for this study. Also, we tried and reached to other populations, and this was 
uh, together with Lorna McNeil, uh, who's the chair for the Department of Health Disparities. And, um, and it's really going, for example, can these practices go beyond the usual population? And for example, can they go to African-American churchgoers? Um, and it was interesting because at the beginning, they didn't want to call it uh, yoga or meditation, kind of fear, fearing that this population would not like those names. And so we called it harmony and health. Kind of internally, we call it the non-yoga, non-meditation non study. But what was interesting that the yoga person reported that uh, at the end of the study, one of the people came to her and said, this was great. And it really reminded me of yoga. So sometimes I think we overthink things. We also did studies uh, with people after stroke and, um, and again, improving their uh, they're particularly actually we were focusing on their depression after stroke. We just published that study too. And this is the last study I'll mention, which was really interesting. Someone, um, uh, Dr. Ann reached to me because he realized that um, meditation can be helpful for pain. And he was doing um, um, what they call a TDCS, transcranial direct current stimulation. And so we put it together. He had already shown that by itself, it was helpful for knee osteoarthritis. Now we put it together and actually it was even better. We are actually in the middle of an R1, which is a larger study. Um, and so uh, in a few years, we should get more results. Um, and then in the area of what I do now also is thinking not just of our patients and caregivers, but of our faculty and staff. And so kind of really thinking of self-care. Uh, also, I imagine there'll be students here. And so also for students, you know, think of kind of what are you doing for yourself, for your physical, mental, and emotional well-being. And so that's when I created this program that I call CPR. Uh, but instead of being cardiopulmonary resuscitation, it's compassionate professional renewal. And the idea is using these techniques in an even simpler way to really kind of when we notice that our compassion fatigue, as the literature calls it, a kind of the tank is empty to refill it, kind of remembering that it is refillable. Or as sometimes they talk about burnout, that it's relitable. And then we need to kind of protect that inner flame. As Joan Halifax talks about, compassion and empathy, kind of having a strong back, but a soft front. And really the, the um, metaphor of the lotus that grows in the mud, but continues to flourishing. But one thing that we notice, uh, particularly in stress and burnout, is that just one lotus doesn't, it's not enough. We need the community. So we need to support as a team, as a group, as a family. And so the social support, so think of it as a Kind of supporting a pond of lotuses. Um, I also like doing things with art because I find that that's another way of, of connecting or with nature, of course, um, kind of both kind of nature as this sky and earth, and but also even different plants like lavender and bring them into a way of with meditation. And I never want to forget laughter. And I love this picture of His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, with Reverend Desmond Tutu. And as they're laughing, you can see everyone around laughing. Uh, probably they have no idea what His Holiness and Reverend Tutu are laughing about, but it's laughing again. It's another thing that it's really important. And interesting enough, when I sometimes teach Trungkor, uh, because it's such a different way of yoga. And at the end, sometimes as I was saying, we, we shake and do this sounds of ha and pe. Some people start laughing and I'm like, that's fine. Keep on laughing. That's helpful as well. There's different ways of also connecting to these uh, practices uh, through people like apps. So Empower You with it from Hay House has, I have some meditations and one of my books in audiobook. Muse is another one. Um, I'm actually doing a, a, a practice online with them on April 19th and that's Eastern Standard Time. So I guess for you it is... Uh, I don't know. I have to, I would have to calculate, <laughs> but probably uh, I, I hope it's at a time that it's doable. Um, 
And then here are other things that I wanted to share with you because um, with the MBSI, so Mind, Body, Spirit Institute, Houston.org, um, we have meditations every week for free. I call it power of community because we started it during COVID. And just by being together, it's not just about the meditation. It's about, again, this concept of being together. Like today, right before this, I was doing one. And, you know, uh, someone comes up. I know many of the people. Some are new. But some come and, you know, oh, and you're with your dog. Oh, good to see you. You know, and so this sense of almost knowing each other, you know, in our homes, in our living rooms, in you know, it really gives a different sense um, um, of, of, of how we do these practices, a different way of community, of sangha. Also do meditations in Spanish every month. The next one is May 11th. Um, and then some of them are just in Houston. So I don't know the audience. If some of you are in Houston on Saturday, I'm doing this, what I call a mini retreat, uh, noon to four uh, here at the Jung Center, 5200 Montrose. And then on May 2nd, I do a, a, a something that I also love and it's a fun, which is meditation and tea that I do with Chris McCann, the owner of Path of Tea. So we present four kinds of teas and four kinds of meditation. Um, these are um, my two books on Tibetan yoga, one on Tibetan yoga for health and well-being, which has the 16 movements that I was mentioning from the Atri Trung Kor. The other one, Tibetan Yoga, Magical Movements for Body, Breath, and Mind, is from the Shangshu Ninju Chung Kor, and it actually stems from my uh, dissertation. You can also, for those who want to do more kind of practice, uh, uh, these the, the, the one on the top left is on a wisdom publication that's a perennial uh, Tibetan yoga course, so you can access it at any time. The one in the bottom, is by Ligmincha Learning and has different times. We just finished one, so I don't remember when the next one is, but that's ligminchalearning.com. So with that, I want to conclude. I want to thank Matthew Ricard for that photo. Um, these are the different ways that you can connect uh, with me uh, and um, looking forward to um, connecting with all of you and now to talking with uh, Dr. Galante and all of you. So thank you. Thank you so much, Ale. That was great. I really, really enjoyed it. And you're getting some uh, applause there as well and hearts. Um, and also we have two questions for now. Um, keep, keep People can uh, keep writing them. I also have questions, but I will prioritize the uh, questions from the audience. So the first one is uh, from Meditation Australia. And they ask uh, why Sorry if I mispronounced this, but why Nijang yoga was not used rather than this more physical tool core for people undergoing treatment? Mm. So there's different kinds. I mean, as I mentioned, we also use the Tsalung that might be similar uh, to the Nijang. Um, a lot of times, you know, there's what is available. Um, and I think actually, if you know the the Tsalung practices, particularly um, of of uh, the Mother Tantra, are very simple. Um, um, and like the Nijang, you know, these are actually practices that you don't even have to stand up, right? That so we use both Tsalung and Trungpa practices. And in fact, I mean, kind of going a little bit to responding to you, um, in um, as we you know, when I created the first protocol, I included both. And partly was I was doing my dissertation on it. It was my first clinical study. And I, I, I you know, and um, and so I, I, like many times, put more than what was possible, probably. And then I realized that when I looked at how much they practiced, they practiced the simplest more. So the more that they practiced was the breathings, then the Tsalung, and then the trunkor. So in the further studies, we took out the trunkor and we really focused more on the salung and the breathings. So yes, I, I agree with, with, with you. And uh, um, so that's what we, we ended up doing. Now, again, 
uh, a lot of times depends on the population, right? So if there is a, a different kind of population, some of the truncor might be actually very useful um, to open up uh, both the, the channels and more to, so yeah, thank you. Thanks for that. Now, uh, from John Powers, um, he's asking, did, did these practices have a positive effect on cancer remission? I've known several Tibetan lamas who died of cancer and none of them saw any significant reduction of cancer through Tibetan medicine or meditation practice. Thank you. And is this John Powers, a Tibetologist? Um, Probably. Thank you, John. Um, you know, it's a great question. It's a great question. Um, <clears throat> No, we, you know, we, we didn't even try to measure that. Um, um, we are, you know, coming from, from the integrative medicine perspective, part of what we wanted to do is, can we affect any part of the well-being of the person, even if there is no cancer remission? Now, Many of them did have remission. We don't know if it is because of the trunco or not. I, I, I would actually never uh, really um, um, think that it is because of that or certainly not just because of that. Just to give you an example, um, there's a city not far from here, it's called Victoria. Um, and the Victoria Times published an article of a patient that lives there that would come to MD Anderson. And she would say that meditation cured her cancer. And when they, you know, the, the journalist uh, called me and said, you know, what do you have to say? She, you know, she did meditation with you and, you know, her cancers. And I said, yes, but when we look, you know, when, when we, you know, we're talking with, with the then clinical director, um, uh, Richie, Rich Lee, and, you know, we were looking and, Yes, she did meditation, but she also did chemotherapy and, you know, and other things. So I, I think it's the combination. Um, and I think that even as a cancer patient, although I, I never went through cancer myself, I had family members that have, and in a way that drew me into this area. As a cancer patient, it's not just all about remission. Um, it's really about, can we have a better quality of life, even if we die of this cancer, or even if we're living with this cancer much longer? So one of the things that um, I think more than remission, what we are looking, and I, 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 I think, again, it's hard to really measure, but are these people surviving longer? Can we, can we see anything in more survivorship? Um, what we do see, it's better quality of life. This is another measure, what we call Q, QOL, right? So we are seeing that. So we'll see if we get uh, to remission. But again, um, that wasn't our main goal, at least yet. And as you, John, um, I had at least two different uh, teachers, including uh, the one, one of the ones I showed, Namkanob Rinpoche, dying of cancer as well. So. Really appreciate your answer there um, with all the nuances. And um, we have two questions about chakras and nadis and energy. Uh, in general, they are about um, whether you can explain the chakras a little bit more. I think uh, you use a different term, right? And um, then also whether you think there's any anatomical or biological basis. And also I add my my question around this, which is, do you make this explicit when you teach patients? Do you, do you feel the need to make this explicit? And how, how do people react? Thank you. Mm. Yeah, great question. So, you know, subtle body is always uh, a more difficult part because it's subtle, right? It's like, uh, uh, but so does it have any anatomical basis? Um, if you think of anatomy just from the body, like if I cut my body or your body, uh, are we going to see the channels? 
Probably not. Now, the majority of the bodies that we cut, they're dead, right? So um, the, the, the prana will not be circulating by then anyways. But I, I don't know that that's the most important part. There's something that is felt in that energy where we call it prana, chi, or lung. You know, when we do these practices, there's something that is felt. And, and that is, I don't know, I'm going to use real with quotes because it's as real as you and me, right? I mean, at the end, you know, at least from a Buddhist perspective, the only thing that is permanent is space, right? So none of us are real. Um, and so what's the use of having them? And as Uli, as you're saying, do I teach it into those studies? So I think there is, there's quite a use, both of the channels and the chakras. So if you think of them as these, you know, and again, there's uh, an, another part that is difficult for people is that there's different ways of visualizing the channels. In some, usually there's a central channel. In some traditions, the side channels come just parallel to it. In some others, they cross in each chakra. So which one is right, right? Well, I think they're all right. In the Chinese tradition, they go back, you know, and front. Uh, I almost think that is like, you know, going from here, well, I don't know. Yeah, maybe even to Melbourne, right? I mean, which way does the plane go? Is there just one way of going? No, there's probably many routes, right? And so in the same way, there's different channels that the, the breath and the mind can travel with uh, through. And so... I don't think there's just one way, but I do think they are useful. Why? Because if you think of them as meditative uh, practices, then it's the mind guiding the breath and the channels are support for that in the same way that a visualization are supportive and whether it's real or not, right? The visualization can help you going from visualizing to feeling, to being it, right? And so I do feel that they are really important. And I had actually this conversation with Tupten Jimpa, who is the, one of the translators of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, also because is this, you know, is this too much tantric? You know, but it's also in the medical text, in the Tibetan medical text. And what I do, and maybe this uh, goes also to your question, um, is that when I first teach it to patients, I teach without the channels. So they get used to the, the breathing from one nostril and the other, to coming to different areas of the body, whether they call in chakras or just the chest and the throat and the head. Um, and then slowly, as they start practicing more, it's like, okay, now do it following this pathway. See if it makes any difference. And as you follow the pathway, can you feel that as you inhale through that channel, it expands almost like a balloon as you inhale and it contracts as you exhale? Can you feel that? And, and what's interesting is through practice, the majority of the people feel that. Um, and so they are useful. Um, and, and, and so for me, at some point, it's, it doesn't mat matter how much real they are if they are uh, uh, useful. And, and, and I do believe, yes, that they are uh, real into whatever way we call them real. Yes. Great, thank you for that. Um, I think you said already a little bit about the difference between the, the channels in, uh, in yoga and in more Chinese traditions. Um, could you elaborate a little bit more? In particular, Lee is asking about the difference between the practice of true core and uh, qigong. Oh yes, um, that's a great a great uh, uh, question, and and they are quite different, and particularly with qigong, even more than tai chi. Um, true core. So Tsalung would be more like uh, like you know, it's it's always difficult to make this correlations, but uh, uh, but. Salung is more like Qigong um, in the sense that you're connecting to that breath, 
and doing a movement, but but in, but in the tzalung also you hold the breath, re-inhale, allow it to expand, almost like that feeling like the chi and qigong. And then you do a movement and what you're doing is connecting to that area, to that chakra. And then at the end, letting go. The trunko is much more active, but you have to, in the trunko tradition, you have to practice the tzalung. So while you're doing this movement, it's not like children playing, but it's actually, you're still holding the breath. You're still using the channels. And then when you release, there's this sense of, pop. you know, think of it. And, you know, in these traditions, we talk of the body as a mandala. And many of you probably seen when they do, uh, for example, a sand mandala, that they start from the center, they very elaborate, they go to the periphery, right? And I'm, I'm using this because in Tibetan, right? Guild core, per, center and periphery. And then what do they do at the end? They dissolve from the periphery back to the center. So this is what we do in Trungkor. We inhale, we hold, we do whatever mandala we're doing, hape, dissolve back into the emptiness or the spaciousness of the center. And emptiness or spaciousness here doesn't mean nothingness. It means full potentiality of another thing coming up and another thing dissolved. So I hope that was helpful. I'm sure it was. Um, there's a question about factors in, in yoga that affect the efficacy. Um, I think you talked about aspects surrounding the practice, social aspects and things like that. And so I think um, this person would like you to elaborate a little bit more, for example, practicing non-harmfulness, generosity, anger, arrogance, that sort of thing. Yeah, that's that's a, a great question. You know, Rinpoche and I have been thinking about specifically because some of the trunkor, for example, there's a set that talks specifically about the five um, negative uh, afflictive emotions, right? So uh, anger, jealousy, pride, attachment, and ignorance. And so, you know, so for example, there's one movement and you do this and, you know, in a way what you're doing is opening your heart and your heart is related to space, this space is related to anger. So do you actually, when you do that, you release anger. So we haven't seen, we, we, we haven't been able to use it in a research study yet. I'm not sure it'll be funded, but we, if you're interested, we'll be happy to receive funding for it. Uh, but we, but what we, what we have seen, I, you know, is practitioners using these as their own medicine, right? And, and traditionally, as Lopontin Lenima would tell me, you know, there weren't, right? Hospital, you know, people, yogis in the caves, they would use this as, as their method of medicine. So, you know, for me, if I am angry, which, you know, happens, you know, so I would use those specifically for anger or when I'm, you know, jealous or when I'm attached, you know, I would use those and um, they do have some efficacy, yeah. So, so at least it's anecdotal evidence, but of N of one, but not not just N of one. Actually, many of um, my colleagues and students uh, would say the same. Well, it comes. It's evidence that doesn't come necessarily from from a scientific study, but it comes from the tradition, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's a question around music and sound, vibrations and chants. Um, mm. If you could explain, uh, I, you mentioned actually making some some sounds along with with the practice. So, could you explain a little bit more about how they affect meditation or the, the practice in general? So, yes, um, you know, I think um, sound is is it's a marvelous. I mean, it, it's it's used across traditions, right? So, you were talking fully about you know what the traditions would say. So if you think of mantras of, or seed syllables, bija, you know, all these are used all across tradition. So there's, there's clearly a benefit. So now if we want to, you know, and many times in science, as we know, we're, we, we're reductionists, right? So, so what's, you know, the mechanism, what's the exact, what, what's the active ingredient, right? And I actually don't believe in active ingredients so much. I believe that the active ingredient is active because of its circumstance, right? So same as karma, right? You, so you, you have uh, 
you know, you have the cost, but if the conditions are not there, it doesn't manifest. Now, sounds, I think, are, are, are wonderful because one of the things that they do when you, when you do the sounds, it's another way of focusing um, and a, that, a way that is very different than focusing on your breath. And particularly if there are external circumstances. So one of the places that I would teach at MD Anderson was on the floor right under the PET scan. And for those of you who know what the PET scan sounds, it goes, tuck, 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 right? And so you're there. And so, you know, we're trying to meditate. And so that's a great time. All uh, right. So you're focusing on the sound. So you're not focusing on the external sound. So that's one way. Now, many times the sounds, even though they don't have meaning per se, they do have a way of connecting in a different way. For example, in, I was talking in the Aum Hung uh, research, the I is helpful for clearing, the Aum to connecting, the Hung to bringing into your life. So by doing that, it's another way of kind of bringing a different aspect of cognitive that it's not the intellectual part. So they can be useful in that way. I also think that when you get into more of a kind of a melodic recitation, if you think of uh, or whatever it is, right? That when you get into that and the whole group gets into that, there's a harmonious part that it's amazing. And there's also the vibration as the person mentioned. So there's all these ways. There was a, there was a, um, a conference on Tibetan medicine way back then. I'm trying to remember what year, but anyways, it was in DC. And this uh, Swiss researcher came and connected us all our hearts and had a screen. And he asked us, to say, oh, right? And at the beginning, each one, you know, and you can see the lines all over the, after a couple of minutes, all the lines were going up and down in the same way. They were not together, but they were synchronous. And so there's something about sound that allows that as well. So I think there's a lot of benefits in sound besides, of course, all the area of music therapy, that it's a whole other area as well. So, yeah. Really interesting. So um, I will ask a question, and as a researcher, it will be about research. Um, but um, I think it's uh, it relates to all of this because I was uh, wondering when you were doing all these studies that you when you said you were collaborating with the contemplatives with Ligmincha Institute, for example. So my question is, how does that work in your experience? Um, what was the role of the contemplative institution uh, in that research? And were there any challenges that you had to manage when collaborating with them for this? Um, you know, we've been very fortunate in that, uh, both in the, the ones that we did with the Tibetan tradition, and then we did others with Indian tradition. And, and um, you know, usually we, so for example, in the Tibetan tradition, of course, it was my own teacher, right? And so uh, what I wanted to make sure, actually, when, when the researchers approached me, when Lorenzo approached me, and he said to do this study, I said, let me check with my teachers, even not if, if, uh, if it's doable, if I am even able to do it, right? Am I authorized to do it? Do they want to do this kind of research? And I told him, if they say no, I'm out. Right. So luckily they were very supportive. And then we bring ten, we brought Tenzu Rinpoche as a as a um, consultant to the study. So, you know, so what I would do is as I was creating the protocol, I would run it by him and say, is this right? Am I, you know, does it make sense? And so, and so, for example, just to give you an example with the one with lung cancer patients and the caregivers. Um, I decided to not do all the five tsalung, but just two, the ones related too close to the lung, the, related to the heart and to the central channel. And I told Rinpoche, is this okay just to do two? And he was all for it. You know, so, so but I, I would not do it without his advice. So it was, it was very useful and it felt it was, you know, I, it was not just 
taking, pulling what I thought would be good. And so it was very, very helpful. The same we did, for example, with some um, Indian yoga studies with the Sviasa, the Vivekananda Institute. So yes, we um, now we were very fortunate not to have um, issues there. Yeah. They've been yeah. great collaborators. Yeah, so they, they, they would sort of um, be a check of whether the, the tradition or the, the tools that the tradition was proposing were actually being used in the, in the way that the tradition thought they would be useful. So rather exactly. than transformed into things that perhaps wouldn't have any, any use. Right. Yeah. And if you remember, you know, and, um, you know, you know, but the audience doesn't probably, you know, uh, Rinpoche and I, I, I do a lot of this science and spirituality uh, uh, dialogues where you were part of, too. And, you know, and partly is bringing this and able to speak up and say, hey, well, how are you doing this? What, you know, and so I we always find this incredibly, incredibly useful. So, um, so, yeah. Yeah, well, uh, just to follow up on that very short uh, question about this. So when you create apps, for example, which are fully automated, aren't they? Um, is there also this, what, what do basically, what, what do people in the traditions think about meditation apps and this sort of way of learning? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a good question. Well, actually, I only created one app and it was only for research. Uh, for research purposes. Um, uh, but we do have, you know, videos, YouTube and all these things, right? And um, and I think the tradition is opening, you know, even all these practices of Salam Tunkor were very secret uh, until very recently. And in some traditions, they still keep them very secret. So um, I think depends on the teachers, but they're becoming much more open and realizing that this is a way of reaching out. You know, I don't think that people would think that we would teach these practices online and then COVID taught as well, either you do that or you don't. Uh, but, you know, so I think, you know, for example, the other thing, which is even, you know, much more esoteric, which is the whole area of transmissions, you know, and, you know, they there's some teachers that do them online. So I think it varies teacher to teacher, but I think I I I think the tendency is to support uh, technology rather than than say uh, this is wrong because our text didn't ha didn't mention them. Well, they didn't mention them because this technology wasn't there, mm. right? Um, yeah. Uh, so. Um, so I think the majority, uh, and you can see, for example, the Dalai Lama being incredibly open uh, to these dialogues, to this way of thinking. So I think um, in general, what I've found in the majority of the Tibetan uh, teachers that I worked with, um, that um, they're very open, yet that doesn't mean that they are, okay, do whatever. That's the whole point of having them there to say, hey, you know, well, that is not right, you know. Mm. Um, and some sometimes to even simple things, you know, um, I was mentioning to a group the other day that uh, my teacher saw a video and he said, your hands are in the wrong, you know, they're not in the right posture. You need to do it again, you know. So, so, uh, so, so sometimes it's, you know, it's important uh, that it's not just totally loose. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you, Alejandro, for your presentation today and to our audience for joining us. And um, please subscribe to our newsletter uh, to stay informed about um, these and other event series hosted by the Contemplative Studies Center. And we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you. Thank you, Juli. Thank you, everyone. And you have my contacts in, in the uh, PowerPoint that I'll share uh, or you will share uh, through the center. So Thanks thank very you, much. Everyone.